Actually, the order has changed. So.
Thank <laughs> you. 
Testing one, two, three. Okay, I think we're sounding pretty good here. Okay. Check, check, check. Yeah, we're, we're good. Welcome here, everybody. I'm, it's uh, so good of you all to share your afternoon uh, with us in, in memory of, uh, to help celebrate the, the life of a very special person. My name is uh, Peter Wolf, and I serve as the uh, board chair here of MCC British Columbia, and I'll kind of be your host here uh, this afternoon. Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, I think I first heard uh, the name Henry and Mary Rempo. I think it was either late 2010 or 2011. And uh, of course that was in the context of, of, a, of a donation and a gift and we were, we in MCC were wondering how can we, you know, we were focused on how we were dealing with the gift. But as we, we got into that and, and, and started to appreciate how we could manage the, the gift that Henry and Mary had given us, what emerged was the gift was given by people it was actually Henry and Mary were actually people, and I got to meet them, and and recognize you know the, their lives together. And of course, then uh, Mary's been gone for a number of years, and Henry was alone, and so he emerged as this person. And we developed uh, a relationship not only as a, a, a donor and a, and a charity, 
but also we developed a business relationship and then we developed a friendship and then we developed a spiritual relationship. And it, it, this is just a truly remarkable story and, and uh, I feel grateful to have had a very small part in it. So today, we want to honor Henry's life. And we're going to do that by singing some songs. We're going to do that by hearing some stories. And then at the end, we're going to go and have a good old fashioned Mennonite Fospa together. So uh, Cynthia Friesen is going to be providing some special music. She is the wife of Ken Friesen, the board chair of, uh, of Highland Properties that, that manages Henry and Mary's gift to us. And so I'm going to let uh, Cynthia take us through the first song. Thank you, Peter. So we're going to sing all five verses of Be Thou My Vision, and you're going to have the lyrics up on your screen there. Singing together has a way of just um, really creating a, a cohesion and, and a focus, which was very much one of the goals that we talked about as we prepared for today. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm just going to check. Uh, can you hear me in the back, Meg? Is that coming okay? All right. Others are saying I should speak louder. Okay. I'm going to work on that. Is that better? Okay. All right. My name is Wayne Bremner, and I'm the executive director of, of MCC here in British Columbia. Uh, and when we first met Henry and Mary, 
Uh, they were fond of talking about Albert Schweitzer and his philosophy about the reverence for life. Uh, and the reverence for life boiled down is that good consists in maintaining, assisting, enhancing life, and that to destroy, harm, or hinder life is evil. Albert Schweitzer was a theologian, a musician, a scholar, a humanitarian, a writer, and a Nobel Peace Prize winner. He was also a Lutheran minister, and he wrote extensively about understanding the historical Jesus. And so when Christ was on earth, uh, he taught a lot about love. Uh, and when he was challenged on what the most important commandment was, he said there too, love God with all your heart and love your neighbor as yourself. And when he was challenged on who is my neighbor, he said, well, it's your next door neighbor, but it's also the stranger and even your enemy. This is something that Henry and Mary and, and we discussed over the years as we got to know each other. Henry was born in Russia in April 26, 1926, just six years after MCC was started. His parents were Wilhelm Rempel and Katerina Lowen Rempel. His younger brother Jacob was born in 1929 in Moscow in the midst of their fleeing from Russia to Canada. During that time, he got sick, had inflammation in his brain, and was seriously harmed for life. Henry's other younger brother, Wilhelm, was born in 1934 in Yarrow, BC. He, he ended up going to UBC uh, and worked for a while with Indigenous Affairs with the Government of Canada. He married Hilda, and they have four sons, Eric, Carl, Paul, and Earl. Well, they came to Canada in 1929, first stopping in Manitoba for a time, being with family when they discovered there wasn't enough work for them to do there to earn a living. They moved to Yarrow, arriving here, just not far from here, in December of 1929. Early life in Yarrow was very difficult. It was difficult times. These were the 30s, and life was hard for everyone. It was particularly hard for them as well because they had to care for Jacob, uh, Henry's younger brother. Due to inflammation on his brain, uh, he suffered brain damage, wasn't able to walk or talk very much or to take care of himself in any way. So it was 24-7 care that the family gave, especially Henry's mother. This had a significant impact on their family because they weren't as mobile. They weren't able to go out for social gatherings and oftentimes maybe people were often uncomfortable visiting with them because of Jacob, because he was unusual and people were uncomfortable with that. Life on the farm was difficult. Henry would be picking hops and berries throughout his childhood, but when he got to grade seven, he decided to quit school. Kind of unheard of nowadays, isn't it? Uh, but he decided that he didn't like the bus ride. He got car sick, but also he was struggling a bit with school, and he was maybe also wanting to get his hands dirty and work more. Uh, and so he quit school at grade seven and worked full time on the family farm. After Jacob died at about age 20, uh, the family was able to visit, uh, the, the Rempel family was able to visit relatives in different parts of Canada. And it was also during that time that, that Henry felt the liberty uh, to go to Bible school. And so he went to Winnipeg where he studied uh, for several years at uh, Mennonite Bible School. Uh, and then after that, uh, Henry returned to BC and went to UBC uh, and, and started his university degree in the 1950s. Uh, he received his bachelor's in psychology in 1959, his master's in 1962, uh, and he was very close to completing his dissertation or his PhD. He just needed to complete a dissertation, uh, which he didn't decide to do, instead was working at Woodlands. It was during this time as well that Henry met Mary. Uh, she was also a student at UBC, and she was in the education program preparing uh, to be a teacher. She got her bachelor's degree in 1963 and her master's degree in 1971. Uh, it was just during this time that they, they met uh, and, uh, and got married. And so Mary was uh, a teacher, but also a lifelong partner with Henry and a very shrewd business person as we experienced as well. Well, after Henry completed his education, he started to work at Woodline. 
and many of you will know that it's a, a hospital or a school for people with mental challenges and mental health issues. And it's kind of ironic that Henry worked there because some years ago before that, his brother, Jacob, would have been there for a short period of time. Uh, after spending quite a few years working in the field uh, of uh, human care at Woodlands, Henry decided to pursue an earlier vision that he had for going into business on his own. So there they were in the mid-1980s, and Henry was in his 60s, or beginning his 60s, starting a business when many other people might be thinking of retiring. Uh, and so there they, they were working at it uh, for a number of years after that, buying apartment build, buildings in different parts of the province, particularly in Prince George uh, in BC, and I think also Edmonton in Alberta. As I got to know Henry, we, we took many drives to Chilliwack uh, together, and, and also uh, included visiting around this area here. It's kind of fitting today that we're gathered in this spot here, because it was pretty much exactly 10 years ago that Henry was standing here, right in this spot here, before this building was built with a shovel in his hand, partic participating in a groundbreaking ceremony as, as we got this building under construction in June of, of 2013. Henry and Mary were interested in the goings on of, of MCC, uh, and uh, we often would visit this location on the way to going out to Chilliwack where we'd see the properties that they had recently donated to MCC in order to check on the progress that we were making. I remember hearing more about Henry's story during drives to Euro, especially after Mary passed. It would be a regular Sunday afternoon routine or Sunday morning routine that Henry and I would go for drives into Yarrow and heard many of his stories about growing up. Henry's earliest memories, at least the ones he shared with me, was being a little boy in Russia and having family over uh, and meeting his cousins and feeling like a little guy in a sea of older, older cousins. Uh, he also remembers uh, boarding a ship and going over a gangplank and being worried about falling overboard as they were boarding the ship uh, to come to Canada. He also remembers his brother Jacob crying in agony as he experienced the inflammation and, and uh, the expansion of fluids in his, in his brain uh, that eventually caused brain damage. Henry also has fond memories of picking hops with his grandmother when he was about eight years old. He was very competitive even then. Uh, he would pick hops and he would get weighed last. The, the person who was working the scale knew that he wanted to hit a certain goal. I think it was 80 pounds. Uh, and so he would allow Henry to be weighed last and he would pick him with his grandma and his grandma would pick in his bag as he brought her bag to be weighed. And at the end of the day, they would say, how, how much should you pick today, Henry? And he would very proudly announce what his total would be. Um, they also slept out uh, in the little shacks in the hop fields. And Henry remembers being at the top bunk and his grandma being at the bottom bunk. And for him, he thought it was a little bit scary being up at that height, uh, afraid of falling down. Well, Henry was a hard worker and he remembered uh, hoeing hops uh, and picking berries and uh, being very competitive with other people in terms of how much he could accomplish in a day. He also had a, a streak of adventure. Uh, one incident was uh, when he had a horse uh, that he had been sitting on in the driveway. It didn't have a proper riding bit on and they had bought it from the neighbors and it took off down the driveway and turned right and went at a full gallop towards the neighbor's place. Uh, and then he managed to turn it around and instead of going back to his place, it ran into the train station in Yarrow and then down Chilliwack or Yarrow Central. Uh, and then as it turned right on Boundary Road, it hit the bridge and slipped and fell. The horse went down with Henry. Uh, he remembers getting back up right away and grabbing the horse and, and uh, bringing it home and getting a proper riding bit put on it. So there was that streak of adventure with Henry, but also when he was 19 years old, uh, he noticed that the next door neighbor uh, had a ranch up in the north, uh, up in the Caribou, and he was uh, interested in working on a ranch. And so at midnight, uh, downtown Chilliwack, he grabbed a bus in the middle of the night, went up to uh, Clinton, uh, got off the bus at six o'clock in the morning, uh, and uh, looked around and could see a little motion happening in the general store where he went. Uh, and he waited there for a period of time, and then the rancher came there 
in order to buy some of the supplies that he needed. Uh, and Henry would tell the story that he went up to the rancher and he said, uh, uh, my name is Henry and I want to work for you. Uh, and then as Henry would tell the story in a gruff voice, the, the rancher said, I don't need anybody. Some of you may have heard that story before. And then Harry, Henry said, you can't afford not to hire me. So he's quite a go-getter and, and sure of himself. Uh, and so then after some back and forth, the rancher said, okay, slim, $2 a day and only for the summer. So there he worked for the summer. Uh, and after that, uh, he came home. Henry also remembers putting in water mains in downtown Chilliwack and fixing water mains in various parts of Chilliwack, as well as getting his draft notice when he was 19 years old, taking the train into Vancouver and taking tests. But the war ended before he was called uh, for service. But he does remember many other young men in Yarrow who never returned home. I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, Jacob's life had a profound impact on the family. Uh, requiring care, and especially uh, care from Henry's mother, Katerina. Uh, and so, as you can imagine, uh, running a farm has a lot of work to do, and people would have more than one job running the farm, and his father would also be building houses and barns in the area, uh, and uh, his mom would keeping things home, going on the home front. And until one time when she got sick uh, and had to go to the hospital for a while, so that's when they took Henry uh, to Woodland. Uh, and I think it might have been when Jacob was about 10 years old, something like that. Uh, and uh, it was quite agonizing for them to leave him uh, so far away. And when they came back to get Jacob, uh, they, Henry remembers very clearly as they entered the room and said, hi, Jacob. Uh, he burst out crying uh, because he had thought perhaps they had left him for good but also they noticed there were bruises on his body and maybe he had been abused by other people uh, in, the, in the facility. And so it's ironic that later in Henry's life he would end up working at Woodlands. Our first encounter with Henry and Mary uh, was around this time, about 15 years ago. Uh, they wanted to donate some land to MCC, a piece of property, a lot, in Chilliwack. Uh, and as you can see from the picture above, Henry and Mary, by this time, uh, were very successful in business, owning property in Prince George and Chilliwack and Edmonton and other places. Uh, and, and so they had a lot that they wanted to donate so that we could auction it at the MCC release sale. And so for those of you who don't know, uh, this time of year, uh, MCC hosts an annual release sale. Uh, it's at Tradex. Uh, and we have about 1,000 volunteers who come out and about 15,000 people who attend. And it's a fundraiser to help uh, support MCCs to to address uh, global hunger uh, around the world. Uh, and so they wanted to donate this piece of property uh, so that it could be auctioned. And we ended up not being able to accept the donation because they wanted a little publicity and there would have been nothing wrong with that except that we couldn't give that same publicity to other people. So we had to decline the gift. And, and after their initial surprise and probably a little bit of maybe um, a disappointment, uh, they turned around and made a cash donation to MCC instead, and they continued to make donations to MCC over the years. And at the same time, they visited MCC thrift, thrift stores, like you see here, uh, and the festival where you're seeing thousands of volunteers across the province working to support the work of MCC. And so we're, they're very touched by the way in which volunteers leverage the contributions of donors, and so they were excited about that. I'll never forget the call I received from Henry and Mary, I think it was in 2010, uh, when they asked me, would MCC be willing to be the beneficiary of their estate? But with the condition that we help the poorest of the poor, which was easy for us, because that's our, that's our job, but also that we wouldn't just liquidate the donation of property, that we would continue to operate as a business because Henry and Mary felt that it would give far more over time if we did that rather than just liquidating it and it's gone. It's kind of like the parable of the goose that laid the golden egg. If you eat the goose, the eggs are done, but if you feed the goose, you can have eggs for a long time. So that was their vision and their idea. Uh, and after some investigation, uh, we decided that yes, we could actually accept that gift uh, with those conditions. And so then we set up uh, ourselves so that we could actually receive that gift 
and it was two years later that Henry and Mary made their first donation of property, apartments in Prince George and land in Parksville. Well, it was in 2014 that Susan Beachy and I, Susan was working uh, in the finance area with MCC and would often be meeting together with me and Henry and Mary. Uh, they called us to say they were going on an Alaska cruise. Uh, and uh, Mary was quite happy because it's something she was wanting Henry to do for some time. And Henry was not so happy because he would prefer to be working. Uh, so anyways, as we wished them well, uh, we didn't realize that that would be the last time that we would talk to Mary. Uh, because it, on, that, on that cruise, Ma Mary uh, discovered she was ill. Uh, and about a month or so after returning from the cruise, Mary passed away. Uh, and so during that time, uh, MCC began to help and support Henry uh, in, different, in different ways uh, as he navigated life uh, without Mary, uh, because she was a critical partner to Henry in business, but as well as in his life. Well, we continued to go on drives uh, on Sunday with Henry, and I think uh, you'll see a picture there, which is the barn that Henry, his father built, I think, in 1939. Henry said he was 10 years old uh, when his cousin uh, put him on the handlebars of the bike and pedaled out from downtown Yarrow up Boundary Road to where the barn was built. And that barn is still there today. So his dad's a good carpenter because uh, that's, that's got a long life. Uh, and so uh, we continued to share stories uh, with Henry. Uh, we were always impressed by his depth of knowledge of history. And he loved to talk about uh, Frederick the Great and him being a philosopher king and bringing reform to Prussia, or Queen Victoria and her husband, uh, uh, Prince Albert, and how they cared about the common people. And also Catherine the Great, and what a builder she was uh, for the country uh, of Russia. And also how she invited Mennonites uh, to come to Russia. Uh, and, and of course, that's part of our story for many of us here today, uh, and also part of Henry's story. Their family would have gone to Russia uh, several hundred years ago, along with many other Mennonites. Well, as we would go on these drives on Sunday afternoons uh, into Yarrow, we would often talk about life. Uh, and uh, it's during that time that Henry talked about his days in Bible school. And I asked him how that was, how he experienced that. And he said, well, it was good in, in some ways, but it was also challenging because during that time he had some really hard questions. And I think back then, hard questions weren't welcome. And so you were kind of left to yourself to sort them out. And so there were a lot of unresolved questions that Henry had. And also he explained that he had doubted God and at times was angry with God and felt that now he was outside of the grace of God because of that. And so it was during those conversations that we would, we would talk about that. And my assurance is that nothing can put you outside of the grace of God. Uh, and, and so through those conversations, Henry found peace with God and uh, renewed his faith uh, and, and wanted to continue to live his life with a reverence for life and also to help the poorest of the poor around the world as an expression of what he thought it meant to have purpose in life and to care for others and also uh, to please God. Well, it was when Henry's father was passing away in 1975 that his father said to him at his bedside, Henry, don't work so hard. It's not necessary anymore. And Henry used to say, little did he know, I was just getting started. And as Henry reflected back on that in later parts of his life, he had some regret about not spending more time with his family. Well, Henry and Mary had developed a lot of wealth, which they shared with MCC. And MCC has a wealth of community. And so we shared that wealth of community with Henry and Mary. And so we enjoyed lots of time together. This is a picture of a gathering uh, at Henry's 94th birthday uh, at our home uh, where we wish him uh, a happy birthday. Uh, and in the process, we shared also with him uh, the collages that you see back there as you were coming in. There was a picture of Henry with his vision to use his property to help the poorest of the poor. And there's other 
collage which shows Joshua Makusia from Kenya who Henry and Mary met and his vision was how to end the lack of clean water in Kenya and he came up with the vision of building sand dams and that's one of the things that Henry was very excited about in the early days making a difference in providing water for people who don't have it and so as we shared with him at his 94th birthday about the impact that he was making we said we think we estimated in the next 10 to 20 years, just what you've given so far, you will help over a million people have access to water and food. And so for Henry, that was very moving. Uh, and he said to, to us at the end, uh, as he looked around the table, he said, I, I'll never forget who you, who you are. I won't remember your names, but I'll never forget this evening. This has been one of the best birthday presents I've ever had. And so we honor and, uh, and remember Henry as well as Mary uh, and, and their life of generosity. Uh, and I want to leave you with one last picture of Henry, which is fairly recent. Uh, it's a video uh, just as I was leaving his home saying goodbye and he's saying goodbye back to me and perhaps to us. Let's see if it works. See you later. And I always knew one of those times, it wouldn't be that I would see him again, and so it is. And so we remember Henry and Mary, and we thank him. And uh, he, he is Henry and Mary are leaving a legacy that will make a difference for millions of people for generations to come, and we're honored to be holding that dream with them. Thank you. So much to reflect on and be inspired by in Henry's story. And in spite of seasons of, of doubt, perhaps, in terms of his faith or the direction in which he felt he needed to go, it always seemed to me there was this steadfastness of servanthood. And so I chose, I'm going to just do a very abridged version of um, an incredible piece that I encourage you all to go home and look up on YouTube, but I promised that I wouldn't do all seven minutes of it. Um, it is called a Kantakion, which is from an Orthodox liturgy, and it was written by Canadian composer Rupert Lang for a Remembrance Day service a number of years ago that Corleone was singing and offering downtown Vancouver. So this is, as I said, using the tools I have here, a very abridged version of an incredible um, choral and orchestral piece that I encourage you to go home and listen to at another time. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 
So as Wayne uh, talked about, we here at uh, MCC had the uh, privilege of getting more involved in, in Henry's affairs, in, in helping him uh, manage the business, particularly when, when Mary was gone. And uh, also then we provided arranged personal care for him as, as Henry capacity began to uh, diminish. And so we want to hear from some people today that were, they, sp they spent a lot of time with Henry. And uh, so there's four people from uh, our Highland Property Group that want to share. I'm going to invite Stephanie to come along first. And after that, we'll get Susan and then Jay and then Ken. Sharp people problems. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Stephanie, and I had the privilege of overseeing the general care of Henry Rempel for the last three years of his life. I came to his home uh, twice a week, and I bought his groceries and I took him to doctor's appointments, and I filled his prescription, and I took him to his barbers, and I consulted with his care aides and made sure his general needs were taken care of. I also had the privilege of being there with um, his care aide, Maria, um, as he passed away. All of us in this room now know of Henry's business practices and the extraordinary gift of land and properties to the MCC as his succession plan. But while Henry was a good businessman, this is not the man that I came to know over the past few years. And the more personal side of this man is what I have come to share with you today. So when I first met Henry, he was already in the advanced stages of his dementia. So I never knew what version of Henry I would get when I showed up to his home. It would be like his mind would pull out a file from his history and that would be what he focused on that day. Some days it would be a man simply content to shuffle around random pieces of paper on his desk. Other days, it would be a man concerned about the safety of his home, needing to check the locks on every door of his apartments multiple times. We're talking like 30 minutes <laughs> of locking and unlocking and <laughs> trying to open the doors. Sometimes he would be in a desperate need to discuss the state of his business from what he could remember. He also could be very concerned that he hadn't done enough good things in his life and wished to do more. Other times, he would be quiet and contemplative, commenting on how varying yet beautiful the world was with all its changes. A few memories of his childhood still remained with him when I knew him. He would often discuss the boat ride over from Russia um, and one day he discussed with me in great detail going for a walk with his dad when he was a child in Yarrow and the construction of a new bridge that workers were building. But one thing's for certain is that he never forgot about his car. Up until the last week of his life, he talked about how he didn't have it anymore, how much he missed it, and how sad he felt at not having it in his life. Henry once said to me that he knew he was not an easy man to be around. And from what others told me of Henry when he was younger, that seemed like a very self-aware and accurate statement. And while there were definitely times where he stubbornly refused to do some things, like this one time when he could walk distances with his walker, he refused to get his hair cut. We were halfway there and he stopped and stated that he was much too busy that day to get his hair cut and then began turning his walker around. And there was no convincing him otherwise that the haircut was all that he had to do that day. But still, no, he was much too busy. But while 
in most cases, losing your memories and not knowing the people in your personal space would make you suspicious. This was not the case for Henry. There never was someone so unperturbed about having people he didn't recognize in his home. No matter who walked in through the front door, he would simply look over at them and say, oh, hello. And after introductions were made, go back to doing whatever it was he was doing. Henry became more and more content in not knowing. For the last year of his life, his standard reply to the question of how he was feeling that day was, I don't know. And then he would start laughing. Henry was a very put together man from his wardrobe, a suit he wore most days, but always a hat when going out. Um, to his home, everything had its place. Even the stacks of papers he had on his desk were organized into tidy specific piles and the hand towels that he was given by his carriage to fold were folded neatly and just so. Henry loved music. He had an extensive collection of classical and marching band CDs, which his carriage would ever so graciously play for him daily. I also bought him Andrew Rio DVDs of live concerts so that he could watch the musicians and the audience enjoying the music as much as he did. At times, he even participated by either humming along to the Hallelujah Chorus or clapping along to the up-tempo music. His care aides and him would also sing You Are My Sunshine together, which coincidentally, was lovingly sung to him by his care aide on the evening that he had passed away. Henry enjoyed ice cream and watching the world around him. When the care aides would take him down to the mall for daily walks, sometimes he'd get a scoop of ice cream and simply watch people. He also enjoyed going out on the streets on days when his community was having parades or outdoor markets. He enjoyed witnessing the movement of the ever-changing world. I really enjoyed getting to know and serving Henry in the last years of his life and will remember my time with him. In my memories, he will be the quiet, dignified man sitting at his dining room table, taking an afternoon nap while listening to, while listening to music as it plays in the background. Thank you. Susan Beachy. Can you hear me? Um, okay, my name is Susan Beachy. Um, we're remembering Henry today, but I also, I would like to start by saying a few words about Mary. Um, over 10 years ago when I met Henry and Mary, uh, Wayne and I would meet them in the white spot, and Henry would talk with Wayne while Mary would sit across from me and talk to, she talked about her work. She was very involved in the operations of the rental apartment buildings and also in property development. She was detail-oriented and knew how things were supposed to work. Um, it was difficult to manage buildings from a distance and she complained about how hard it was to get good local managers. She seemed to be the main supervisor of the accounting staff. The Rimple's business success was due to Henry's drive, intelligence, and instincts, but also to Mary's tenacious work in keeping things on track. Mary loved to travel, but Henry didn't enjoy it as much, so she didn't go as often as she would have liked to. She did go to movies often, taking Tuesday afternoons off to go enjoy a movie with her sister-in-law. Um, some of this is, I'll try not to repeat too much. Um, Henry told stories about historical figures that he admired, um, I wanted uh, to mention Albert Schweitzer too. He was interested in great minds and polymaths like Albert Schweitzer. He talked about how Schweitzer accomplished, accomplished so many things and then devoted himself to building hospitals in Africa. Henry talked about Karl Gauss, a German mathematician whose genius was recognized when he was a small child and many other notable figures. 
I think Henry was similar to these people he admired in that he read widely and had interest in a lot of areas. He obviously had an aptitude for selecting investment properties, plus a work ethic that would be hard to match anywhere. He wanted only to work and was not interested in wasting time on activities for fun other than reading. And he loved music, as Stephanie mentioned, uh, and the marches were a common theme in the CDs that we found. Um, I understand from Bill Battison, Henry and Mary's lawyer, that Henry's one guilty pleasure was following the Formula One races on television. He also indulged himself with high-end luxury sports cars once he could afford them. Henry grew up working on family farms, as you heard. Although it wasn't always easy for people around him, his drive and work ethic resulted in a fortune that he and Mary decided to, live to leave to MCC to be used to help people who were in unfortunate circumstances. The knowledge that their estate was built through hard work and sacrifice makes it all the more incumbent on us to ensure the assets are used for these purposes that Henry and Mary were committed to. Henry's readings included a lot of books and articles about faith and religion. We found um, some undated writings by Henry himself where he explained his thinking about God intervening in human suffering. He said that humankind should work together to solve the world's problems instead of relying on God to step in. He thought that if people work together, we could level out the disparity in living conditions around the world. In his last several years, he would often talk about how we all need to do our best and work together. This was a recurrent theme in his thinking that he returned to again and again, and I think it's important for all of us to remember this. It was an honor to work with Henry and Mary. Hi, my name is Jay Tech Robe. Um, I first met Henry uh, at an MCC event right here uh, in late 2015. Uh, he was on the arm of Gerd Bartel, who I think is here today, right there, yep, yeah. uh, who was assisting him as he was walking uh, around the newly opened MCC Center. My first impression was of a dignified, gracious, but frail man. I was about to become uh, the first dedicated employee of what was then known as MCC Legacy Trust. In the first part of 2016, Wayne would arrange for visits with Henry and I, encouraging him that I may be able to help him with his businesses. Uh, we would go for drives through Abbotsford, touring various projects that I had been involved with. Uh, they were lovely visits, and I appreciated just how well read Henry was and, and the uh, depth of his in intellect. But each visit was like a meeting for the first time. Uh, it, by mid-2016, I remember saying to our board, I'm not sure how much I'm going to be able to help Henry if he can't remember who I am or what I do. Uh, but uh, Wayne would offer his help, and, and Henry would graciously say, uh, thank you, but I just don't know how I would use Jay. Then in the fall of 2016, things changed. It was really through a crisis that our relationship blossomed. His business part partner in a project on Vancouver Island was coming to meet with him, along with uh, 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 the, the partner's lawyer, who is formerly the, uh, the lawyer for, of Henry from Edmonton. Henry knew this was gonna be trouble. Uh, there was something wrong and he really didn't know what to do about it. And finally, he knew that this MCC guy, me, could possibly help. We met where all Henry's meetings uh, occurred, which was in the white spot, in the podium of the building uh, in which he lived. I got to witness firsthand with these partners uh, were doing, and it wasn't good. From Henry's perspective, the meeting went very well. I was his shield and there to help him solve these business problems that he was dealing with. Thus began uh, our weekly pattern of meeting every Tuesday to discuss quote unquote business. Uh, those Tuesday meetings carried on until the end. We had a shared family connection to Yarrow of the 1930s and 40s. As my father and his siblings grew up, they were the same age as Henry, 
experiencing the same thing in the fields that Henry's family was experiencing. Henry was not a man that would uh, meet without being, there being a productive purpose to it. So the fact that we could talk about things that were business oriented made all the difference in the world. After Mary's passing in, in the fall of 2014, there was a big gap in what made the Rempel family successful. Harry, Henry was the visionary, the big idea guy, the risk taker, and Mary made sure that things got done, that it made sense, that brought logic and a sober second thought to the initiative. Henry was the right brain, Mary was the left brain. Together, they were a whole brain. And it was apparent that when uh, Henry was dealing with complex, uh, difficult issues, carrying the burden after Mary had passed away, uh, was now entirely on his own. And, uh, and, and we were able to, to help share some of that burden as he was prepared to leave, uh, reveal them to us. He was singularly focused on, on his purpose of helping to use his significant resources to help the poorest of the poor. I recall in December 2018, we were up in his office as we always were meeting in, uh, as we always did at his desk. We were breaking and about to go downstairs to the white spot for lunch. Henry went into his uh, suite to use the washroom, which wasn't uncommon, it wasn't uncommon for him to be in there for a while, but he was taking a long time. I went in to check on him and to see, and, and I found him lying face up across his bed. Eyes were rolling into the back of his head. He was turning purple, sweating, and clearly in distress. I called 911. The paramedics got there nine minutes later. Eight firefighters and paramedics were on the scene. They injected him with an, a, a, a adrenaline. Oxygen was provided. Henry was on a stretcher being wheeled out of the building. He was unconscious as he was being taken away. I followed by car to the Royal Columbian, and he was in what appeared to be a chaotic inner city emergency room. Lights, noise, just chaos everywhere. He was lying on a gurney in the middle of the emergency room. As I walked in and walked up to him, he looked up at me and he said, now, I want to talk to you about Vancouver Island. <laughs> Fifteen minutes earlier, we thought that he was gone. Henry gave selflessly and sacrificially. He was an inspiration and a role model for many. The combination of MCC's mission and Henry's selfless example inspired many to give selflessly of their own business acumen and expertise as well. Jerry Friesen, our beloved Jerry Friesen, who's been gone now almost a year, former CFO of Interfor, he viewed his thousands of hours, literally thousands of hours that he dedicated to this, this uh, service of Henry and the mission. Uh, Fran is in the audience here today. Uh, to, and, he, and, and Jerry would say, this is the most important work of my life. My brother Ken. Thousands of hours dedicated to this purpose, all made possible because of the foundation of the gift that Henry made. Kevin Weeb, we're renovating apartments. Who better to help renovate apartments than Kevin Weeb? He said, gladly, I will help you. They were motivated by Henry's example and MCC's mission. It is why I joined this group. Those that were called upon were awestruck by Henry's example and gave generously of their expertise. Henry was a man of multiple paradoxes, a man whose career was really launched after he retired, a man who placed little value except for those cars uh, on material possessions, yet would acquire significant wealth, a man who was so private, quiet, and humble would inspire and give rise to so many gifted individuals to give sacrificially of their time, expertise, and resources. Henry was so pleased when the mayor of Prince George, Mayor Colin Kinsley, 
said publicly that the Rempels had done more for Prince George than any other individual. And he was proud of that because he said it was an example that would motivate others to do something similar. The Rempel story isn't ending, it's just beginning. It'll be an example for others. We can't let it fade into the white noise of life or be eroded by time. It's, ins it's inspiring, too important, too worthy of being a story for generations. Men MCC was a good fit for Mary and Henry. Uh, they are the hands and feet of Christ. MCC is the hands and feet of Christ putting faith into action and action was what Henry wanted. Now MCC must be worthy of the Rempel investment, an investment measured by souls nourished, pain alleviated, and lives saved. In the last few years, as you've heard, uh, as Henry's health declined, we kept our Tuesday meeting, meetings. But they became about caring for Henry and ensuring that the care was there. And uh, the care aides, Maria, Imelda, Marilyn, Angela, loved him completely. Stephanie ensured that the, his needs were being met. Susan was there on a daily basis. And we had a system and processes in place to ensure he was cared for. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Ken Friesen. Uh, too close. Let me put it up a little bit. There we go. Uh, I am the husband of Cynthia Friesen. I've been chair of MCC Legacy Trust since its inception. And uh, this has been quite a journey. It's a journey that arose when uh, Wayne and I were first in the AGM and then met with Henry and Mary at their office at the White Spot and then offered up at that time Prince George and Nanaimo. And uh, we acted quickly, checked out those properties, consulted with MCC and uh, made the first steps of creating what is now MCC Legacy Trust now is Highland. Highland properties, and I have to start by talking a little bit about all the people that, you know, particularly in this room, that uh, that the gift that Henry and Mary have, uh, how many people that they've touched through that, and how many lives have already been changed. His direction was to, of course, create opportunity for the poorest of the poor, but he's created opportunity for us too to provide uh, a chance to give. And um, I think of the author, David Brooks, who writes in the New York Times, and he's kind of a polemicist, moral polemicist. And he, one of his books he wrote about was about Second Mountain. And Henry's life began, he, he talked a bit about the influence of his brother Jacob on his life. And so um, Henry, when he, his interests were wide, but when he was quite young, he wanted with his father to get into real estate. Dad wasn't so interested. And so he made the move into psychology and then goes and works at the, uh, the very place where his brother was. Um, no doubt, of course, you can see the direct line in that activity. In the, in the David Brooks book, he writes about the, having your first mountain. Your first mountain is, is achievement. It's basically, it may be self-centered, but everyone must go through the first mountain. See opportunities and seize the opportunities and see what you can become and what you can contribute. And uh, after you've gone through that mountain, and I would say with Henry, he went through three mountains. The first mountain was to become a psychologist and to look after the kind of people that, uh, that suffered um, in institutions which were poor. No doubt he was compelled by that, by the, what he saw vis-a-vis -vis his brother's own experience. It's unusual, he ran it through till he was 50, I think 55 almost, before he began investing in properties. Then he went back to what it was his passion. No doubt the first part was a concern for his brother. The second part was his passion play. His passion play was success. Success was me measured by achievement of getting properties, both properties in Alberta and BC. And I can tell you, he never wanted to let go of any properties. His biggest regret in life was losing the properties in Alberta because there was a supposition that Alberta wasn't gonna be a good investment. And that, that, those sort of decisions haunted him. 
felt like he had needed to succeed. And he was intuitive. Uh, I remember we went to the property in Nanaimo uh, just after he had gifted it to us. And it was just this beautiful piece of property. Looks over the mountains, looks down at the fields. And he, we had about six or seven of us, and he said when he purchased this property, he'd never walked it. I was like, I can't believe that. that. That can't be. But he had an intuitive nature about him. His wife, Mary, was the person that would manage the detail. And he could think big thoughts, because Mary was there minding the store. Uh, and, his, and in thinking the big thoughts, as he grew older, and he looked at his uh, affairs, he thought himself about what David Brooks would talk his second mountain, but really for him, the third mountain. What is he going to do with all of that? What is his life's meaning? And for Henry, more so than Mary, because Mary got, not really got to see the end of that, but they went on the journey together. And Henry and Mary were there for the initial gifts and to get the, get the ball rolling. But intuitively, Henry understood that, uh, as Wayne described, the golden goose, he, under, he understood British Columbia real estate. Most of us do have a sense of it. Uh, that that would be contributing far more than winding up his real estate empire. And so he began the process. And while this gift is one of the largest gifts in Canada's history, I think what's unusual about it is the intuitive sense that this is a business that could be taken on and to give it a continuous fashion involving our community, which is a, has a history of volunteerism and has a history of real estate. And that vision because of many people, point to Wayne here, who uh, does a lot of the quarterbacking, uh, but others that are along this journey have come together. The board that we've been working together for many years, new board members, Peter's joined now, as Jay retires and Jay's diligent work. And I have to say one of the joys of my life has been working with Jay. Coming together is, he kind of thought not exactly, but intuitively understood that. And so that third mountain is a mountain of collective action, of collective good. And, uh, and so that's, that's, the mount, that's the mountain that's corollary to self-achievement, this achievement for the, the greater good of, of, uh, of the collective, not the autonomous, but the collective. So um, with that, thank you, Sydney. Well, let's collectively sing When Peace Like a River, It Is Well With My Soul. Um, we've got just a couple of verses, and I have found an arrangement. The piano is, is quite lovely, so I hope it gives you space to breathe. And um, just, it's like we've been granted a feast, a Henry feast, and we need to digest it. Maybe you want to stand, actually, and join me while we sing this. When peace like a river attended my way, when so
Coming uh, close to the close of our our time together, uh, and uh, so we thought we would give you a little bit of a glimpse around the world uh, about what um, the broader MCC family uh, is experiencing as a result of uh, the generous support of Henry and Mary. Uh, and so I have some tributes from different people around the world that I'd like to to share with you. Uh, the fir first one is from Han Ann Graber Hirschberger. She is the uh, executive director for MCC in the U.S., but back in the 80s, uh, Anne was working as a nurse in Central America during the Contra War, where you would have refugees who would be fleeing from different parts of Central America. And so she was assisting uh, those refugees, uh, and here's what she has to say. As a nurse and a mother, I resonate with Henry's dedication to the most vulnerable in the world. When I was an mcc -er in Central America in the 1980s, I cared for a child and her mother in El Salvador, traumatized by mortars being fired from outside their home. The child's eardrums were burst, and the mother was unresponsive to voice or to touch. MCC's presence made a difference in the lives of that family. Generosity from people like Henry and Mary over the years makes this possible. Their foresight and care in seeking a way to continue to support these efforts into the future, a legacy of care that will outlive most of us. I thank God for Henry and Mary and for those who now steward these assets to help the most vulnerable people in the world. The next one is from Jimmy Mulanda Juma. Uh, at the time, uh, Jimmy, as we would call him, uh, was the uh, country rep for Congo in Angola. He's currently now working in uh, Rwanda. And so at the time, uh, he was working with refugees in Congo. Uh, there was conflict between different areas and millions of people were on the run from one part of Congo to another. And so he was sharing with Henry about the plight uh, of these people. Uh, and so uh, Jimmy writes the following. I met Henry once in BC. We shared meals together and laughed. I was amazed by his care and compassion at heart. I was deeply touched by Henry's love for the poor and the vulnerable, which led him to share his wealth with MCC. When I told him that I was once a refugee uh, and that at that time MCC supported me, MCC was very moved. He saw and understood that his support to MCC goes a long way, saves and changes many lives. On behalf of the many poor and vulnerable people around the world, who benefit from Henry's support and touch, and MCC staff around the world, I send my deepest appreciation to Henry and my deepest condolences. In this next picture, you'll see uh, the response of Henry's gift, helping people have the basic necessities of life as they're fleeing from one part of Congo to another. And if you look at this next slide, I think it'll work. It's a video of people singing a song of appreciation. Let's see if it works.
Well, you, you can imagine if you uh, were Henry in that moment and knew that your help had made the difference for those people, it was very moving. It was very moving for Jimmy and Melanda uh, as well. Uh, this next one uh, is Ron Ratzliff. Uh, Ron Ratzliff is the chairman of the board of MCC Canada. Uh, but when Henry and Mary first started their journey with us, Henry was the country representative for MCC in Kenya. He was responsible for overseeing the building of sand dams. And over a period of time, over a thousand of those sand dams had been built. And each one would provide clean water for thousands of people in a community. And so uh, Henry met with, with Ron, and here's Ron's words of tribute. I had the privilege of visiting Henry to thank him for one of his first donations to MCC, designated for food security and water. As I described the functioning and the impact that access to water had on families, especially women and children, I saw Henry's interest increase. He had many questions about how the sand dams work, the filtration, how long the water could last in the sand, and many more questions. Impact of his gift was very important to Henry, especially to children and women. I was present at one of the larger construction events where over a thousand people had gathered to build one of the largest sand dams I had ever visited. Henry was excited to see the local self-help as people pitched in. They weren't just receiving help, they were part of overcoming the problem. Ron goes on to say, our commitment to help everyone in need, regardless of where they come from, resonated well with Henry and Mary, and they were keenly interested in having their donation act as an endowment having a yearly impact of revenue that can help people for generations. May we be faithful to the intent of Henry and Mary as we continue to serve. That's from Ron Ratzliff. And now you can see a sand dam and what it looks like. Uh, they terrace the mountain size and water collects in the bottom and the sand traps it. You can continue moving and then as a result of having water, people have water to drink, they have water to irrigate crops, they have food to eat and it changes the entire cycle of life. Next one. This is Jeannie and Dan Yancey. Uh, they came to my home uh, to meet with Henry. They at the time were the Asia directors for MCC and they oversaw programs in different parts of the world including Vietnam and Indonesia. Here's what they had to say. My husband Dan and I had the opportunity to meet with Henry back in 2015. At that time, we were serving as MCC Area Directors for Southeast Asia. You can move to the next slide. Wayne Bremner invited Dan and I to have dinner at his home together with Henry. I remember that Henry had a lively interest in learning about MCC programs in Indonesia. He was also particularly touched by MCC's work with people with disabilities caused by Asian Orange. We thank God for the legacy of Henry uh, and Mary Rample, the love he has shown to, to people he will never meet. He truly cared. And as you can see, this uh, young man is actually 20 years old and he's one of the victims of Agent Orange. It's now working its way to the fourth generation. Uh, it was sprayed on crops and it causes birth defects uh, for generations. We don't know if it'll continue, but there's over 150,000 children in Vietnam who are impacted. And so this uh, is something that particularly touched Henry uh, because it reminded him of his brother Jacob. If you look at this next slide, you'll see that MCC is assisting this single mom uh, continue to care for her son by providing her with a cow. With a cow, she can have milk, and then she can produce something that generates income uh, and support the family, and also have calves, which also is a source of income. Henry liked the entrepreneurial, self-reliant part of that help. Next slide. And this will be the last one. This is our executive director, Rick Koberbaumann. And as he's sitting there with Henry, he has just come back from Syria. And I think you can bring to mind the news of Syria where uh, there's ongoing bombing. Over a half a million people have been killed. About 11 million people have been forced to flee their homes. Half of them fleeing somewhere in Syria and the other half fleeing to neighboring countries and some coming to Canada. As, as Rick is sharing with him, this is what he says. I met Henry once and was able to share how MCC was responding to the severe food needs of family displaced two or even three times by the war in Syria. I recall his simple question, 
that I help people, that I help provide food for those children. You did, Henry, you did, those and many others. But no matter the size, all gifts are given only when the spirit is generous. And your spirit, Henry, was deeply generous. May that your legacy, a deeply rooted spirituality of generosity, continue. Our gratitude for your generosity will continue for years to come. As your gifts are shared with our global neighbors, God's love and compassion is shared. Thank you, Henry. May God be with you. We're deeply appreciative of uh, the generosity of Henry uh, and Mary. Uh, and, and now we, we stand to steward this gift for generations. I'm deeply moved to see so many people here today. When people reach an older age, very often the funerals are smaller because most of their friends have gone. Uh, but here we have probably 70 people. And even though we're a small crowd here today, millions of people around the world will be impacted by the generosity of Henry and Mary Rempel. And for that, we are deeply grateful. We're deeply honored to be a been chosen by them to hold this trust, and we're deeply honored and appreciative of people in our community who have gathered around our board table and our staff leadership in helping us steward this gift so that we can have the maximum impact for the poorest of the poor around the world. So thank you, Henry and Mary, as you look down upon us. And uh, thank you all very much for coming. Henry had quite a diverse love of music and musical genres, uh, everything from Beethoven to, uh, to marching bands, which I just learned about now. Um, I was preparing a Bach piece for all of you, um, but last week Ken and I had an opportunity to hear Yo-Yo Ma perform with the Vancouver Symphony, and it was an incredible Dvorak symphony, but as his encore, he offered going home, and um, so I was inspired to, to learn this for you. Going on and on and on 
Cynthia. Well, our time has almost uh, come to an end. Uh, just some, some closing thoughts here. First thought that strikes me is I'm concerned about the viability of the white spot in New Westminster. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe it'll be okay. Um, the other thing is just some, some other thoughts. Just how interconnected life is. Remember that picture of the red barn? that Wayne showed you, and it was the neighbor on the one side with the, had the horse, right Wayne? Yeah. So beside it, who lived there? Well, that would be my grandparents. Amazing. And uh, my, it was my aunt that uh, helped remind us that bring the connection together, and, and we were able some years ago to, Wayne and I and my aunt and Henry, to meet together and have coffee right over here. And, and I, I think Henry still managed to connect connect all the dots uh, in that meeting. So it's, well, and then Henry's family moved to Chilliwack. Well, and who were their neighbor? Shirley Sue's family, who's a former board member here of MCCBC, and the families actually shared cooking implements together. I mean, it's just these connections of life that, that you uh, discover. I think Ken said it, one of the largest gifts that Canada has, has ever, someone has ever donated in Canada. I can, uh, I can just tell you how seriously we on the board of MCC, the board of Highland Properties, the staff of MCC and the staff of Highland Properties, how seriously we take that commitment that Henry asked us to honor his gift in producing income for the poorest of the poor into the future. And I stand here today and that's our solemn vow. If Henry were here, Henry would say he understands the amazing potential, present and potential impact of his gift. And, and I think he, we were able to communicate that to him. But if Henry were here, I think he would be astounded by the stories of impact that his life had on all of you that are here today. It's amazing. You know, when, when you get involved in the life of someone, your life changes as well. And I, 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 I know I speak for all kinds of people because we interacted with Henry. We're different people and we're grateful because of it. So now, uh, well, it's time to say goodbye. That time has come. So let us close our eyes and we're just, I'm just gonna say a prayer. So Father in heaven, we, uh, We have been reflecting on the life of Henry and Mary Rempel. And today in particular, we're, we're saying goodbye to Henry. Henry has always been in your care. And I'm so grateful that he was able to rediscover that you loved him deeply and able to participate in that love. And, and we know that as we go from here, that their gift with our, with our help will continue to impact the world. And uh, we do that uh, because we want to share your love and compassion for all in Jesus' name. So now we say uh, goodbye and amen. One more song from... Uh, Sing, Be Still My Soul together. And again, maybe uh, let's stand.
Thank you very much for coming. And as I said earlier, we, we're now going to enter into a time of, of FASPA over in the cafe. There might not be enough seats for everybody in there, uh, but we'll, we can move, move chairs in there. So please come and, and take uh, in some, some light refreshments. If you need a washroom, there's one washroom in the cafe and we have more washrooms upstairs. You go up the stairs, head to your left and to your left and you'll find the, the washrooms there. Again, thank you so much for sharing uh, your afternoon with us as we said goodbye to Henry. God bless you all. Thanks for coming. <laughs>